Oh, you don't care about the camera part? No, no, no. I'm telling they're worried about this. Yeah, well, who cares? Anyway, back to this. Yeah, where's your remote for the camera? Huh? Where's your remote for the camera? Is that why do you say it like that? I can't try it. Yeah, there we go. That's it. It doesn't have to be that way. Right there, where they. Sorry. No, that's good. That's right? good? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, oh, you're still live. So. so it's still live? Yeah, you're still going right now. Thank you. Okay. Now we've got this. Thank you. Now we've got this thorny problem figured out. So anyway, in 1865, the Civil War ended. And in 1866, the next year, the U.S. government sent troops back out to the plains. There had been troops out there, but when the war broke out, you know they went back east to fight. But now the fighting in the east was over, and so they go back out to the west to finish off this Indian War business once and for all. And it was a small immigrant army, only 25,000 men taking on 150,000 Native Americans. Uh, the army had better technology, and eventually that will decide the issue. But at first, all the Native Americans had to do was to fall back and fall back and fall back and, and just stay out of the way of the army, and they were pretty safe. The biggest problem that the army had was catching the, finding the Indians, finding the Native Americans, and then uh, once they found them, trying to catch them by surprise. And if they ever caught a village by surprise, it was pretty uh, good odds. There were pretty good odds that the army was going to win. I don't care if there were a few soldiers and a lot of Native Americans, uh, but uh, there were uh, the, there were good odds that if they could catch them by surprise, that the army the army would win. Okay, so uh, the army marches out to fight the Indians in 1866. Now get this down, and the and the government decided to fight start the final. Uh, phase of the Indian Wars up here in Wyoming. So write that down, Wyoming. Did we do this yesterday? Yes? No? Good. All right. In Wyoming. And there was a trail that ran through Wyoming called the Bozeman Trail. Uh, and the Bozeman Trail, get all this information down, the Bozeman Trail ran right through uh, Sioux Indian country. There were some Cheyenne and others there, but right through Sioux country. And you remember that the Sioux were known as the lords of the Northern Plains. They were the toughest, maybe, or the most ferocious, the most fierce tribe up there. So the army couldn't have picked a better spot to test its mettle. On the Bozeman Trail, wagon trains, I'll just use this right here, uh, here, you know, here's Wyoming, pretty much square like that. And the Bozeman Trail ran like this, and the settlers were coming up that, and periodically Native Americans would attack their wagon trains. So to deal with this problem, the Army started building a series of forts all up and down the Bozeman Trail. Here was Fort uh, Laramie. We've talked about it, and it was sort of the Army's base of operation in this theater of the war. Uh, and the plan was this, if you're going up the, if you're going up, well, that won't work very well if it's not plugged in. If you're going up the Bozeman Trail and your wagon train is attacked, you would send a rider to the nearest fort to get troops, and they would come and they would help you fight the Indians. That was sort of the plan that they had. And the most isolated fort here, get this down, was a fort called Fort Phil Kearney, okay? Fort Phil Kearney. And it was out in the middle of nowhere. And it was deep, deep in the Sioux country. It was isolated, okay? And uh, <clears throat> the uh, situation 
was sort of like this, Fort Kearney. I've been up there on a couple of occasions. Uh, and it was up on a hill. And there was a, there's a valley that runs about three miles. And then there was a ridge here, write this down, called Lodge Pole Ridge, about three miles away. Lodge Pole Ridge. And there was a stand of trees right down here. Uh, and uh, the fort was up on top of the hill. Uh, and there were 450 men in that fort, and they were surrounded by thousands, men and women, and they were surrounded by thousands of Native uh, Sioux warriors, and they were scared to death. In fact, the co commander of the fort, when people came to him for help, rarely let any of the soldiers go outside the fort because he said this, if I, if I send 50 men out to fight to help a wagon train and they get killed, that will so weaken our defenses that the Indians might overwhelm us and kill all of us. They even had a drill at the fort where they dug a trench right down the middle of the fort and they stacked barrels of gunpowder on both sides of it. And they would have these drills as if they were under an attack uh, and they would stand a soldier there at the head of that trench. They would make all the women and children go down in that trench and they would stand a soldier with a torch like this there. Uh, and, of course, his orders were, if you see the Sioux Indians coming over the wall, throw the torch into that trench and jump in yourself and blow up all those women and children. Because it, it's much better for those women and children to die than to be taken captive by the Sioux. That was their attitude. Uh, so that's how dangerous things were. Well, get this down. There was a young captain in the middle of all this. There was a young captain who arrived at the fort. Mo, get this man down. Red Cloud, he's the commander. He and who? He's got a 23-year-old kid who eventually I think ends up being his son-in-law. Uh, Red Cloud and who are in command of those thousands of uh, those thousands of Sioux warriors. How many Sioux warriors do you know that we've talked about? Crazy Horse, write that down. Crazy Horse and Red Cloud. And they've got those soldiers surrounded. And this young officer right here, write him down, Captain William Fetterman arrives at the fort. He arrives at the fort. He's from the east. He doesn't know anything about the west. He doesn't know anything about Indians. He's like another young lieutenant we talked about. Who was that that got himself killed? He's a captain, but this other guy was a lieutenant. Yeah. Who? Yeah. Who? Grattan. Grattan. So he arrives at the fort. Get this down. He arrives at the fort, and he tells the commanding officer, you know, instead of saying, get, get all this down, he arrives at the fort. I don't want you doing anything else but taking notes. He arrives at the fort. He tells the commanding officer, what are we doing hold up in this fort? The enemy's outside the gates. He said, we need to get the troops to go out and thrash those Sioux Indians. And this older officer looked at him and said, we're outnumbered by the thousands. They'd wipe us out. And he laughed at the commanding officer. He said, get right there. This is what he said. He said, give me 80 men. Just give me 80 men. And he said, I'll ride through the whole Sioux Nation. In other words, give me 80 men. I'll whip all of them. And the commanding officer just shook his head. Well, one of the, so, so Crazy Horse and Red Cloud are here observing this. And what do they want to do? What, 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 the, what is their big problem? They can't what? I know that's a broad open-ended question. They can't what? What, what do Crazy Horse and Red Cloud want to do? Run? No. Why should they run? There are 4,000 of them and 450 soldiers. They want to kill the soldiers, but what do they what do they have to do to get what were you gonna say? You usually come up with pretty good answers. I was gonna say they want other people to be safe, but well they certainly want that, but I'm talking about in relation to the army down there in that fort. They want to kill them. What do they gotta to do to kill them? They gotta climb over the well, well, they don't have. They might. They might lose a lot of men themselves. What? How do they know they can destroy these soldiers? Get them what? 
Oh, because they have way more than they do. Yes, but how how do they how do they know that they can just wipe these soldiers out if they can do one thing? What do they want to do? Surround. Well, get into the fort. What? Do they want to get into the fort, or do they want to what? They want to get, 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 get the soldiers out of the fort. There's only 400. Just think about this. There are only 450 of them, but they're relatively safe as long as they're in that fort. But if we can get them out of that fort, we can kill them all in one afternoon. So that's crazy horse and red cloud's problem. Well, they observe what's going on at the fort. This is in Wyoming. It gets cold in the winter. And this was a, listen, this was a wood-burning fort. They had to have it to heat the barracks. They had to have it to cook. They had to have it to heat water. Everything was related to wood. So get this down. The government hired, the U.S. government hired a um, group of civilian woodcutters to go out there to Fort Phil Carney. Civilians. You're all civilians. You're not in the military. They hired a group of civilians. They said, get this down. They said, go out there and... Every day, these civilians, every day, these civilians would leave the fort. You could set your watch by it. The gates would swing open, and they would ride down here to this forest with a group of soldiers protecting them, and the woodcutters would get out of their wagons. In fact, they even took the wheels off their wagons and put sleigh runners on there in the winter so they could move faster. But they would go down there, and while the woodcutters cut wood, the soldiers would stand around their rifles in case any Indians showed up. And every day, Crazy Horse and Red Cloud observed them doing that, okay? Uh, so they came up with a plan. They came up with a plan. Get this down. They said on December, that it happened so on December 21st, 1866. They said on December 21st, or they didn't say on, they said on this, or they decided on this day that when the woodcutters came out, they decided on this day that when the woodcutters came out, they would uh, send, they would send uh, about 50 warriors down to attack these woodcutters, okay? And so when the woodcutters and the soldiers come out, they send 50 soldiers down there off Lodge Pole Ridge, and they attack those soldiers. And when the first, and, and woodcutters, and when the first war hoop goes up, the woodcutters and the soldiers circle their wagons, and they got in there and started shooting it out with the Indians. Now, the Indians are riding completely out of range, but they're visible. They're yelling and shooting and firing toward the soldiers, but they're completely, completely out of range. That should have been a dead giveaway to those soldiers and woodcutters. Something's up here. Uh, and, of course, the, the officer here decides, he says we're surrounded. He decides to send one man, boy, you talk about a dangerous mission, right through those Sioux Indians back up to Fort Fetterman, uh, uh, not Fort, Fort Phil Kearney to get help. And that guy actually rode through all those Indians. Did he ride through those Indians or did they let him ride through? They let him ride through. And that should have been a dead giveaway that they're springing a trap. And this breathless rider gets to the fort and he says, this breathless rider gets to the fort and he says to those, uh, 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 to the commanding officer of the fort, the woodcutters are cut off. They're about to be killed. They need help. The commander of the fort put together a platoon of 78 men. What did Fetterman, how many men did Fetterman always say he needed? 80. 80. He put 78 men. And which officer is there at the officer's meeting going, let me go. Fetterman says, let me go. So the commanding officer, he had a lot of misapprehensions about this, but he said, I'll let that hothead go just to get him off my back. So he puts him in command. How many men are there now? So they're, they're at the gate. About to, they're about to swing open the gates and let Fetterman go. There's an interpreter standing there, and he's drunk. One of these interpreters must have had a rough life. Everyone I've talked about has been drunk. But this one was drunk, and he said, Hey, Captain, where are you going? He said, I'm going out there to kill some Indians and rescue the woodcutters. Can I go? You can go. You can stay. I don't care what you do. Just don't get in my way. And that guy hopped in his saddle, and that gave Fetterman 80 men. What he had always said, he whipped the whole Sioux Nation away. Cap, uh, Colonel Carrington, the commander of the fort, just before they swing open the gates, and Fetterman leaves. He walks in front of his horse. Fetterman's sitting up there on his horse, chomping at the bits. Just ch it's kind of like when your parents give you the keys to the car the first time, and they're giving you this long lecture about stop, look both ways, don't speed. It. And you understand, yeah, 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 yeah. Just get out of my way and let me in the car. Well, that's how Fetterman feels. 
just get out of the way. Yes, sir. And, and, the, and you know, in the Army or in the military, orders are everything. Colonel Carrington said to him, here are your orders, Captain. Rescue the woodcutters. Do not go past Launch Pole Ridge. Yes, sir. You under, do not go past. Yes, sir. And with that, they swung open the gates, and Fetterman, Fetterman and his men started out. As they're leaving, Colonel Carrington is up on the wall, and when the last horse gets out of the fort, he yells to the whole column, Halt! And he calls Fetterman back, and boy, Fetterman's just beside himself, and he goes, Yes! Yes, sir! We go, what? And he goes, Remember your orders. Do not go past Lodge Pole Ridge. Yes, sir. And he wheels his horse around and they take off. And they come storming down the hill. And when these 50 Indians see the soldiers coming, they turn around and they run up here to the top of the hill. But they don't go over the Lodge Pole Ridge. They're just up there and they're waving blankets and they're laughing. And of course, the woodcutters, they take off and get the heck out of Dodge. But these 50 are up there and they're waving blankets and they're yelling uh, insults down the hill at Fetterman and his men. And Fetterman's down there in the woods and he's just looking. He's just, he's just chomping on it. Like, I can't stand it. And finally, some of the Native Americans, and I'm not trying to be profane here. I'll get, I'm going to do this and it's going to be on tape. Uh, but, you know, I'll get on to one of you out in the hall and when they've got you about to send you down to ISP, you'll say, well, you know, he cussed in class. You know, you ought to take him out in the parking lot and whip him with a bullet. I know how your sneaky little minds work, but uh, I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, this is history. This is a quote. This is not profanity. Uh, but anyway, some of those Indians had been up to the fort. It's kind of funny. They had been up to the fort. And uh, uh, they had heard the soldiers. They didn't know much English, but they heard the soldiers calling each other this word, and they really didn't know what it meant, but the word was son of a bitch. And uh, that's probably the only English they know, and they start yelling down, hey, you son of a bitch! And uh, Fetterman's just getting mad, and he just can't take it anymore, and so he disobeys orders, and he orders a charge up that hill, and those 50 Indians run, and he goes over that hill, and it's just like this being a cliff and a group of men coming over it just like that, and he just glided into a sea, get this down of 2,000 Indians. He's got, he's got his 80 men, 2,000 Indians. And they're not on horses and they don't have feathers in their hair. They don't have all this Hollywood crap. They're just standing there calmly. And some of them have bows and arrows, some of them have lances, some of them have rifles, okay? And when he comes over, uh, it was probably over in about 10 minutes. They killed every one of them, okay? They killed every one of them. Fetterman and his second in command. His second in command was a guy named Lieutenant Brown. He and Fetterman were found lying boot to boot. Like Fetterman's laying back in this direction, and he's laying back in that direction. Both their faces were black, and they had a single hole right between their eyes. You know, I told you about this thing in the Indian War, save the last bullet for yourself. Well, this last 10 minutes, and he sees they're going to be slaughtered, and so instead of letting the Indians kill him, he and Lieutenant Brown probably in a kneeling position, stood up, cocked their pistols, and each placed his pistol on the other one's forehead and counted one, two, three, bam, shot themselves, okay? They butchered these bodies. They dragged them up and down this valley. Uh, the next day, the Army, and it's cold. It's, it's in December in Wyoming. It's cold. There's snow on the ground. They uh, uh, sent out a patrol to find them. They found body parts strung out for 10 miles. They found one soldier, he had 172 arrows in it, okay? Uh, they picked, the soldiers picked up the arrows, just to show you, the soldiers picked up the arrows. I don't know why the soon left them behind. They picked up 40,000 arrows. 40,000 arrows fired at 80 men. How many of you think are going to survive, okay? Uh, anyway, get this down. This is called the Fetterman Massacre. Write this down, the Fetterman Massacre. And I'll ask you about that tomorrow. And remember how you spell massacre, the Fetterman massacre. Well, guess what? <laughs> guess what? <laughs> the uh, guess. Uh, <laughs> oh. Uh, we're done. <coughs> no, we're not done. Where do you where do you think you are? Yeah, I just like. <laughs>
My tuberculosis is just acted up. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll be like Doc Holliday. I'll be dead in three weeks. But anyway. Oh, I'm just kidding. Two weeks. Anyway. <laughs> well, look. Guess what? Who's winning this war? Indians. The Sioux Indians. Write this down. Do you know the Sioux Indians are the only nation that ever defeated the United States Army uh, in, in this on this continent where we are? The Sioux Indians. They're winning. Red Cloud and the Sioux were winning. What happens in a basketball game when the opposition in the first 40 seconds of the game scores 10 points? Usually the one like the... Right. Do what? What does the coach do? Oh, yell. Yell. Calls a timeout. We got it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I, I asked this the other day in a class. Somebody said he resigns. He just gets up, so I quit and walks out the gym. <laughs> no, but usually call a timeout. We got to stop this. We got to get together. Well, guess what? The government looks at this and says the Native Americans are defeating us up here on the Great Plains, we got a, oh, by the way, there's American horse. Uh, Fetterman shot him, or his, they committed suicide. But when he, they found his body, his head was almost cut off. Uh, and this uh, guy right here, American horse, was a Sioux warrior. And he, after he, even though Fetterman was dead, uh, they, he cut his throat, okay? He almost cut his head off. Must have had a dull knife and couldn't get the job done. Anyway. Uh, listen, uh, the government called a timeout, and a government timeout, get this down, is called a peace conference. Write that down, a peace conference. They said, we got to have a peace conference. We got to stop this fighting. We're getting, we're getting whipped. And so they met at Fort Laramie again in 1868. Get this down. Fetterman's killed in 1866. Two years later, they meet at Fort Laramie, Wyoming. Second Fort Laramie Conference, Fort Laramie, Wyoming, 1868. The government sends representatives out to Fort Laramie and they meet with Red Cloud. And they say to Red Cloud, what is it going to take to get you to stop killing our soldiers? And Red Cloud says, you got to do three things. Get these three things down. Number one. You've got to sit up. Number one, you've got to uh, burn, uh, to abandon all those forts. You got to get out of the Bozeman Trail country. And what did the government say? Okay. Yes. Yes. By the way, when they abandoned, finally abandoned Fort Phil Kearney, as the soldiers were marching out. They were looking over their shoulders, and before they even got out of the side of the fort, the Sioux were already burning it to the ground. I've been up there on a couple of occasions uh, doing some work in the Indian Wars, and you can still see the foundation of Fort Phil Kearney. Just one second. I'll do this real quick. But they're white stones, and they're st you can still see the scorch marks from where the Native Americans burned. You ought to get up there and see that sometimes. It's fascinating. Anyway, second thing they said is uh, we want you uh, to, uh, rem uh, well, two things here. We'll just do two. Uh, we want you to set aside the Black Hills. Where are the Black Hills of South Dakota? Well, where are the Black Hills of South Dakota? They're in South Dakota. We want you to set aside the Black Hills. We want you to say that no whites can ever live in the Black Hills. No whites can ever live there. You know why? Because... And by the way, here are the here are the Black Hills. They're not black; they're white. What's the tourist attraction? This is what humans do. Look how white that is. And you say, well, why do they call it uh, the Black Hills? Well, the Sioux word for that is Pahasapa, and Pahasapa means dark at a distance or dark uh, far away. Uh, and I was driving up there. I was driving up there about the middle of the day, and in the middle of the day, they look dark at a distance. When you get up there, they're white, and they're very beautiful mountains. But we stupid humans. We look at something that took nature billions of years to create, and we say, that's not good enough. We're going to put four big old heads up there. So we put four big old heads up there. There they are. And they've got a stage below that. There's some moron down there in a frock coat and a red wig pretending to be Thomas Jefferson and singing a song about the Declaration of Independence. And people just do and on. I said, don't you understand? 
they destroyed half a mountain for this, you person. But anyway, uh, there's Washington, Jefferson. This is Mount Rushmore. Washington, Jefferson, T.R., and Lincoln. I think Teddy Roosevelt must be rolling in his grave. He was a great conservationist to think that they would blow up half a mountain to put his face up there. Uh, he'd have shot him. The Native Americans protested this. In fact, there was a Native American activist in the 1970s. He was so angry about this that he crawled up on top of George Washington's head and peed down the front of it, okay, <laughs> to protest this. But then what did the Native Americans do? They went and blew up part of a mountain, and they're putting one of them just down the road from that. Uh, and, and who's that? That's a great Native American hero. Who's their great hero there? It's Crazy Horse. What's the problem with that? Nobody knows what he looked like. That might be one of my old high school yearbook pictures, okay? That might be me up there. Anyway, uh, anyway, the, the Sioux believed, after all that silliness, get this down, this was a sacred spot for the Sioux. They believed that this is where the earth opened up and the Sioux Nation walked out. And they also believed that when they died, it was the gate to heaven. That's where they went back to Mother Earth. And they said, this is sacred to us. It still is sacred to the Sioux people. But it was 2022. And they said, we want no whites to settle there. And what did the government say? Deal. That's the 18, don't forget that. That's the 18, that's in 1868. Things are going to change five years later. All right, your test will go down there. You're there. Stay. Yeah. Yeah. A terrible computer to get a plastic duck. That's great. Report to the football field. Uh, Message for Ben Team. Yeah. Yeah, Sixteen year old that. trumpeter. Is everybody here who sits in that seat? No one. Good. Well we do have to recruit one more person. I'll have to perform in front of a full house. But anyway, so everybody's here. All right. So um, 
we won't record the lecture today. I've been recording those for when people are gone. So if you're ever going to be gone, let me know, and I will do that. Anyway, uh, let me find my place here. Um, so your test is tomorrow, and where will it begin? Uh, in the end okay, so take your notes on the night of study. And always, listen, always go back a little bit beyond the end of wars for review questions. Okay, look over your notes and make sure you have the following things down. Um, here's, here's what you need to know. Number one, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, just look at your notes, you probably got all this already. But the, the Battle of the Little Bighorn was the most, it's the biggest and the most famous battle of the Indian Wars. It was between the U.S. 7th Cavalry and uh, Sioux and Cheyenne, mainly Cheyenne, Sioux, excuse me, mainly Sioux. They were led by a host of war chiefs, but the main chief was Crazy Horse. So this is a battle between Crazy Horse and Custer. One of the best books I ever read about this. They used to require you to read it in college. They may still do it. It's called Crazy Horse and Custer. It's about the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Um, and um, what the Army decided, that well, what happened was in the uh, uh, summer of 1876, over 10,000 Native Americans gathered here in the Little Bighorn River Valley. And the government's going to send out three armies to crush them. None of these names survive in history, you know, unless you're a history major probably, but Alfred Terry, John Gibbon, and George Crook. Nobody remembers them. The one we remember is Custer. And these three armies were going to converge on that village and crush it. And they believed that when those three armies converged on that village, that village would break and run. Custer, of course, uh, is given an assignment. He's not even really supposed to fight this battle. He goes west uh, and he will uh, position his cavalry on horseback quicker uh, out west to block the Indians when they try to escape and drive them back into the army. That's all he's supposed to do. Well, if this plan had worked, you would have never probably heard of Custer. Maybe not ever heard of Custer, although he was a nuisance and he had a way of making himself known wherever he was, so he might have made the history books anyway. But uh, Custer arrives, uh, you know, the, the, the timeline is this. These three armies are supposed to arrive on Monday, the 26th of June, 1876. Uh, Custer arrives, he takes out, he gets his orders, he's going to position himself out west. He takes out riding with his cavalry. He, give, he, he marches them 40 miles a day, they're exhausted. And they get south of the village about 15 miles on Saturday, uh, Saturday night, really, Saturday night, uh, June 24th, 1876. And his attitude is good. We got here early. We'll take our saddles off of our horses. We'll everybody will get, we'll eat. We'll get a good night's sleep. And then Sunday, June 25th, which is the actual day of the battle, Sunday, June the 25th, we will just take a leisurely, well-rested ride over here and be ready. And Monday morning when the three armies show up, we will be in position and we'll be fresh and ready to fight. That's what was supposed to happen. But as you know, when he got south of this village on Saturday, June 24th, it's nighttime already, and they, those exhausted soldiers start 
unsaddling their horses and pulling pulling those heavy packs off those pack mules, what did they discover? Some of the bread. Yeah. There were some, some, one of the canvases had come loose on the trail and bread had fallen out. And of course, well, what did that mean to Custer? Yeah. Huh? The will find it. And if they find it, they will what? Yeah. They'll, and this is on Saturday. They've got two days almost <laughs> to clear out. And when the army gets there, this will, they'll all be gone. And the army was delighted that there were 10,000 Indians there because they said, we finally got them where we want them. We're going to end this war in one, we're going to end this 25 year war in one day. Uh, so Custer sent men back to find, and they found the bread boxes. And what was that? What else did they find there? Jesus. There were three, and they were eating. Were those Native Americans part of this big encampment? Yeah. No, but they just took off. Custer's men assumed that they were. They ride back to Custer and tell him, We've been discovered. And so now Custer has to make a command decision. Do we sit here and wait? Until Monday when the armies show up, or do we attack in the morning on Sunday? And he made a command decision uh, to attack on the June 25th, and he did. Uh, so that takes us up to the background. And when he got to uh, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> when he got to the little Bighorn River Valley at about noon, about noon on the uh, our map. About noon on Sunday, he's right here, and he did the same thing that he did at the Washita. He didn't scout ahead. He didn't want to tip off this large village. And by the way, this village looks like it may have been ten miles long. Huge village. And I think it's the biggest village ever uh, constructed on North American uh, soil. Uh, but anyway, uh, he doesn't scout ahead. He divides his men into four parts. Uh, he sends Reno with 150 men down the valley to attack these Indians. And, what, and when and he told when Reno was drunk, when he told Reno, go down and tell, you've got 150 men, there may be 4,000 warriors down there, go attack them. What did Reno, you know, say? I mean, he's, 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 you know, I mean, in so many words, are you crazy? And what did Custer tell him? Don't worry, what? I'm going right, to be right behind you with the rest of the regiment. So it takes Reno a while the time to get down those cliffs, and he's got to cross the river, and then he's got to line up. While all that's going on, Custer sends Benteen all the way out here to the west. Custer says, when we hit them, they're going to run, so you block their escape. And then he takes off here, uh, riding along the top of this ridge three miles, marching his already exhausted men and horses at a breakneck speed or as fast as they can go. And they get down here, and Custer tells his men to get off their horses. And he can stand up, and he can see that I've stood where he stood. <laughs> you, you don't need binoculars. You can, that village is right there. I mean, it's like walking. It's like walking from here to that concession stand down there. That's how close he is. Six hundred and fifty. He's got two hundred and fifty men up here. And by the way, all the warriors are down here fighting Reno. The village is empty. There are women and children. Uh, they don't even. You know, they're they're going about their women. You know, Custer looks at his spyglass down there to get a close up view. The women and children are cooking. Children are playing. It's just a normal day in the village. And they don't even have any idea that there's a threat up here. Uh, and so this is where we stopped, right? So at this point, my point, you know, a lot of people have this idea that Custer was some wild man and he rode off in a bunch of Indians uh, and got killed. Well, he rode off into a bunch of Indians and got killed. But the point is, at this point, at 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon, he has won the battle because all he's got to do is cross over there are no warriors here to stop him. They're three miles away. All he's got to do is ride down here and get between the warriors and their women and children, and he wins because those Native Americans will not attack. And then all he's got to do is stand there for about 20 hours and wait for what? The, the next morning when, when who shows up? The, rest the, the other army. three are. Are you getting this? The other three armies. And then he's won. He's the hero of the day. They were even talking about, he, he was talking to, to his closest officers about if we win this great battle, 1876 is a presidential election year. This is in June, July, August, September, October. In six months, we were going to elect a president. He said, he said, if I win this battle, if I win the Indian Wars, I may be the next president of the United States. So there he is. So he tells his men to mount up. We're going to go down there and take that village. It's going to be just that easy. But just before he left, he remembered he needed his ammunition. If there's going to be a standoff here, because as soon as those Native American warriors find out that he's in their village, they're going to come back, and then they're just going to be standing. 
they're going to need all the ammunition and extra men that he can get. But the natives won't attack because their women and children are there. So anyway, anyway, he decides to send a message over here to Benteen, who's out riding west here. He decides to send a message to Benteen. And uh, I showed you the uh, immigrant, didn't I? Giovanni Martini. We, we talked about him. Okay. Well, Custer calls his orderly up. He's getting ready to go, but he calls his orderly. Write that down. And his orderly was a 16-year-old. An orderly was a messenger. That's what they called him in the Army. And every day, the commanding army of a regiment would pick someone in the regiment to uh, be his orderly for that day. Well, this is the luckiest day of this kid. He's 16. He's your age. He's an Italian immigrant. You don't have to write his name down, but his name was Giovanni Martini. Just off the boat from Italy, he could barely speak English. And that day, Custer pointed at him and said, you come with me, you're going to be my orderly. That saved his life. He's, he's the last white man to ever see Custer alive, okay? Here's a picture of him. That's not him when he was 16, obviously. He was a uh, career, he survived the battle and he became a career soldier. He was in the service for 30 years. He became a sergeant. That's his retirement picture, okay? But he was only, he was this tall, skinny 16-year-old kid in, uh, in uh, 1876. By the way, he lived... Uh, he lived in 1922. He was in Brooklyn. The way he got killed, he was in Brooklyn crossing the street and a beer truck hit him. But uh, anyway, he survived the battle. And uh, Custer calls this boy up. And he said to him, he said, I want you to go, Martini, I want you to go to uh, Captain Benteen. And I want you to tell him to come on. I need his men to swing around and on the way pick up what? The ammunition and come on and tell him to come on quick. And the boy saluted, probably only understood about a, what a third he heard. <coughs> Custer's second in command was there. He was a guy, he was a Canadian named W.W. W. Cook. I ought to have a picture of him. He had these long, his sideburns, he grew long down to his belt. When the Indians killed him that day, they didn't scalp his hair, they didn't take his hair off, they scalped his sideburns. And they tied his sideburns around their spears, and they rode away with that as a battle trophy. But W.W. W. Cook, he didn't like immigrants very well. He didn't like anybody very well. And he sees that kid salute. Custer asks him, understand? Yes, sir. And uh, he turns around, and he yells, Martini, come here. He said, dumb immigrant. He probably doesn't even understand English. What's the matter with him? Come here. And he... Hey. Excuse me, teachers, but we need the cheerleaders to be released at this time. <clears throat> So he pulls out his orderly book. An orderly book is just a little pad that officers can write messages on. And there's the page. Well, there's the page. I'm going over there, I guess. Yeah. Well, there. There's the, that's at the West, uh, museum at West Point. That's the last message from Custer's column. And you can tell he wrote it in a hurry. Ben Teen later wrote this when he got it. That was... But this says, Benteen, come on, big village, uh, be quick, bring packs, W.W. Cook, P.S., bring those ammunition packs. And this kid, I, this is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. This kid <laughs> rides right through the middle. Here are people fighting and dying all over the place. He rides through that, and he didn't get a scratch. And I probably nicked myself shaving the other day worse than he was hurt. And he hands the message to Benteen. And Benteen turns his column around and he heads back to get those ammo packs and then come join Custer. And again, this is all in about a three mile radius. We're not talking about him marching 50 miles. Uh, but on the way to those ammunition packs, he runs into who right here? Reno. Reno, fighting for his life, fighting for his life. And so Benteen stops there and they call the ammunition packs over here. 
okay? Uh, and they don't go any further that day. Meanwhile, three miles away, get this down, Custer has started his descent into the village. He has won the battle at this point. He is starting his descent in the village. But he had a problem. You know, if in history, there are not a lot of cavalry charges because cavalry needs broad, open, flat ground. I mean, it needs to operate miles and miles of flat ground. And that's not what Custer had. Because look at this, on these cliffs above the river. Look at this. On these cliffs above the river, this is what the ground looked like. I can get to it. That. Look at that. What would we call that in Oklahoma? We call it a ditch or a gully. Uh, up in Montana, they call those things coolies. Write that down. They were coolies. That's not broad open ground. Coolies. Here's a better picture. That's a fall picture. It's kind of dark. But by the way, there's the Little Bighorn River. That's how close they were. And the village was right on the other side of that tree line. So that's, you know, they're almost there. Here's a better picture of it. Okay? So instead of lining up like you see them in the movies and they all charge together, they had to break up in little groups of four or five men each for about a mile long. And they had to imagine that. They had to navigate those horses down that. In a little narrow path about like that, you're navigating a horse. They're all scattered out there in small groups. Well, there were two Cheyenne boys playing right over here on the other side of the river. And they all of a sudden looked up and they see 250 soldiers strung out for a mile. They run, they're in the village. The village is right there. And uh, they tell uh, people and they send uh, warriors straight to, to these men. And uh, Reno and Ben Teen are here. They think they're about to be overrun and killed. And all of a sudden, all those Indians just disappear. And they go storming back up the valley. They come into the village. They don't say, how you doing? What's going on? Where are they? Uh, they splash across the river. While they're going across the river, most of them get off their horses. Uh, all up here is this tall grass. It's a perfect sniper's post. And they start crawling, thousands of them. And those soldiers don't know where they are. A soldier will be there looking. Uh, you know, they're trying to reel their horses back. They'll be there looking. Uh, and all of a sudden, five Native Americans will pop up and shoot them. In Vietnam, they would have caught, this is a firefight. That's what it is. Uh, and in this holy Hollywood stuff that you see where Custer and his men are sort of, one part of it's like that. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But where they're surrounded and the Indians are riding around on horses, yipping and yelping, it just didn't happen that way. Uh, and they're shooting at them. Uh, and uh, uh, most of Custer's men are killed right out here. They find them in groups of five or six or eight. You know, finally, they see they're not going to be able to turn their horses around. The Indians are on foot. That's a great advantage. They're coming out of the river. Uh, and so uh, they uh, swing their horses around. Uh, and get off of them, and they try and get in those gullies, and they're trying to fight, and the Native Americans are everywhere, and most of them are shot down there. Custer, though, get this down, and about 40 of his men, you see those tombstones there? Custer and about 40 of his men make it up to the hill, the high ground, the hill overlooking the Little Bighorn River. Here's, a, here's another, look at that. You see, there's the village there, there's the river, and this is all that broken ground, but they fight their way back up here, and they, and they say that they buried those soldiers where they fell, so you can see it's kind of a ragged line. They shot their horses, they shot their horses, uh, and the Native Americans come up and swarm them. In about 20 minutes, they're all dead. And that's Custer's, that's Custer's last stand. Uh, it was the greatest battle of the Indian Wars. The Native Americans won it. Uh, the Sioux Indians... But it made absolutely, get this down, it's a great victory, but it made absolutely no difference. Within a year, both uh, Crazy Horse and I think Sitting Bull, both, uh, they're both dead by 1877. Didn't make a bit of difference. Didn't slow, didn't slow the wide advance uh, one bit. Didn't slow the wide advance one bit. But it is the most famous battle of the Indian Wars. It was a really bad day for the Custer family. Not only was George Armstrong Custer killed, but his two brothers were killed. Uh, 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 Tom Custer and Boston Custer. He had an 18-year-old nephew. Well, this guy had bad luck. The, the Custers were from Michigan. He had an 18-year-old nephew that had uh, tuberculosis. 
And what does doctor tell him? He's, he said, isn't your uncle one of those the famous Indian fighter out there? Why don't you get, is he going on any campaigns this summer? Well, yeah, he's going on this Sioux campaign. Why don't you go sign up with him and go out there? The air, fresh air would be good for your lungs. And so Custer hired him to drive the pack mules and he's 18 years old and he dies out there uh, on Custer, on Custer Hill. Custer's uh, sister, uh, Margaret, she had, her husband was in the regiment. His name was James Calhoun. He was killed. And so all this happened. The Custer family was pretty much wiped out in about 30 minutes. One horse, I'll come back to these. There's Tom Custer. He was killed. There's, I think that's Boston Custer. That's James Custer's brother-in-law. He gets killed. That guy's a guy named Miles Keogh. He had a horse. He was a captain. He had a horse named Comanche. There's Comanche. Remarkable story. Comanche was shot five times in that battle. Now, there were a lot of horses that made it through the battle. The Native Americans just took them with them. But there were a lot of horses wounded. And, then, and on Monday, the next morning, the three armies show up, and everybody says, where's Custer? Uh, they go down to Reno and Benteen. They're still dug in. And uh, when they get there, Reno, Reno and Benteen, they come out of those uh, trenches, and they say, "Where?" their first one, where's Custer? Nobody knew. They go north uh, exploring, and they find him and his men. They're dead. Their bodies are all chopped up. His is not. They just cut the tip of his little finger off and ran a sharp sewing all in his ear, okay? And that was it. Other than that, he looked like he normally did. But the others are not, of course, everybody's clothes are stripped off and everybody's chopped up, including Custer, but he's not chopped up. But there are a lot of wounded horses and these cavalrymen had the sad duty to walk around and put those poor animals out of their misery. And when this soldier got to Comanche, he's laying there shot five times. It's like he knew what was about to happen. So he stood up on his front legs and, he's, <laughs> and the soldier said, if you can get up, old boy, I won't, I won't uh, shoot you. And uh, anyway, they managed to get him up, and they ring, they rigged a, a swing between two mules, and they took him all the way back to the Yellowstone River, built a stall on that steamboat, put a swing there. He couldn't stand on his feet, uh, and they took him all the way back up to Fort Abraham Lincoln. It took several days, and he survived. He lived 29 more years. And he became the regimental mascot of the 7th Cavalry. Anytime the 7th Cavalry paraded, he was never ridden again. Uh, they put a saddle on him and they put a boot in the saddle, reversed. If you see a boot reversed, that means the rider's dead. And a sergeant, that guy right there was assigned one duty to take care of that horse. And he uh, uh, would lead him in the parade. And so uh, that went on for years and years. And finally, this sergeant, died and about two weeks later Comanche died and instead of burying the horse they stuffed him and there he is he's in Manhattan Kansas not far from where you're sitting at the University of Kansas in a glass case the reason they put him in a glass case is that uh, when he was just sitting out there in the open with fraternities at the University of Kansas would tell their pledges if you want to get in our fraternity you got to break into that museum and steal Comanche's tail so they kept yanking his tail off so they finally got the tail back and they put it in a, in a bullet, bulletproof uh, you know, glass case there uh, with an alarm system. So that stopped that. But that's one of those deals. If only that uh, horse, uh, horse could talk. Okay. Well, um, this, was the greatest, this was the greatest victory of the Indian Wars. Uh, the Native Americans won it. Have I given you all the names? It's known as Custer's Last Stand. The Battle of the Little Bighorn. What did the, what did the Native Americans call it? Uh, write this down. I didn't think I had. Mr. Montgomery, come to the office. The Greasy Grass Fight. You ever hear that? And you'll probably see it that way on the test. The Greasy Grass Fight. That's what the Native Americans call it. Okay. Well... A year after his victory, get this down, a year after this great victory that Crazy Horses had won, he was dead. And this is a perfect example, one more example of divide and conquer, okay? There's a close-up of Comanche. Well, that, horse, that horse saw the whole battle. By the way, so did thousands of Native Americans 
And uh, there was a Native American, I want you to write this down, his name was American Horse, and he fought at that battle. And this is one of his paintings of the battle. He painted 42 paintings of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and that's one of them. And there you see these dead soldiers. There you see Indians on horses running down soldiers. There's the village. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, there are the chiefs, the victorious chiefs standing there looking at the dead soldiers. But so the idea that nobody knows what happened to the little big horn is just baloney. Okay? It's just baloney. Uh, plenty of people know. Uh, there were thousands of Indians. No whites survived the battle, but there were thousands of Indians that did. And by the way, speaking of paintings, I want to go back here real quick. Uh, you know, I, I've often told you that Hollywood often ruins history. Well, they didn't have movies in those days, but they had artists. And artists did the great events in those days, sometimes what, uh, what uh, Hollywood does today. This is one of the most famous paintings of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And if you look, just go back here, uh, back here, that's what the battlefield looks like. Look at that. Why? Look at this. Well, if this is true, the Battle of the Little Bighorn must not have been fought in Montana. It must have been fought in the Swiss Alps. The Indians are on horses. They weren't. The Indians are wearing these ridiculous headdresses. Indians, those were ceremonial. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's like you, well, anyway, Native Americans didn't wear all those feathers when they went into battle, usually. Uh, and, uh, of course, here's Custer and his men. They're in dress uniforms. They all have swords on. They didn't carry swords that day. In fact, swords were just ceremonial, too. Uh, I know in the movies, everybody's hacking people, but they were ceremonial. You used them when you were in a parade. Uh, they took all the swords of the 7th Cavalry before the 7th Cavalry left uh, uh, Fort Abraham Lincoln, and they made them put them in big boxes, and they nailed it shut. The things, stupid things would just get in the way. So there's a lot wrong with that. But this picture right here, I just want to show it to you. It's by a man named Edgar Paxton. And Edgar Paxton didn't just pull out a canvas and start splashing paint across it. He studied that battle for 30 years. And this was painted in the 1930s. And in the 1930s, there were still some soldiers around who, who had fought at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Obviously not with Custer, or they wouldn't have survived the battle. But they had fought at the Little Bighorn. And he interviewed them. And some of those soldiers had been on the burial detail when they went up there to bury Custer's men. So they go up there uh, to uh, the battlefield. They go up there to the battlefield, and those old soldiers went around and said, yeah, there was a tall, red-headed soldier here that I helped bury. There was a guy that was dead here, and they sort of helped him as to where the soldiers had fallen. Well, if you know where the soldiers had fallen, you might know where they stood and fought. Uh, and then uh, he got Native American chiefs who were or warriors, some of them have been chiefs, who were still alive, who had actually been there in the last few minutes of the battle. Look at this. That's why I've got it up here for you to see. If you were talking to me about something important, I was sitting behind my desk and I was doing this, you would feel insulted. Well, that's how I feel. You're here to get an education. So look at this when I want you to see something. Anyway, he took these chiefs out here, and there's nothing to note here. So you just put your pencil down and look right up here. If I'm going to act like I'm teaching third graders, I'm capable of doing it. But anyway, he placed them on his canvas. And if I had, I've seen that painting. If I had that painting here, it would stretch from that door there over to where Siobhan is sitting. Okay, it's that wide. And if I were going to stand it up in the back of this room, if I were going to stand it up in the back of this room, I'd have to take out some of the ceiling tiles. It's huge paint. And I'm not telling you, because this was years, this was like 70 years after the battle. I'm not telling you that it actually looked like that in the final minutes, but it might have. It might have in the final minutes, okay? So there uh, is a, a, maybe a fairly accurate painting as to what happened. So there are a lot of references, but, but this is absolutely not what happened. Artists did, artists did with great events in those days what, um, what uh, Hollywood often does with them uh, today. Well, now you can note this. A year after his greatest victory, in 18, you know, Custer's last stand is in 1876. 
In 1877, crazy, or by 1877, Crazy Horse was dead. Uh, there was a split among the Native Americans about how they ought to proceed after Custer's last stand, okay? They knew the army was now going to redouble its efforts and come after them. Red Cloud here, and there's Red Cloud. Red Cloud here said this. He told the Sioux people this. It's time to quit. Yes, we've won this great victory. We've won this great victory, but it is time to strike for peace. It's time to strike for peace. Um, further resistance against the government is going to get us nowhere. We need to stop fighting and get the best deal that we can. We need, listen, we need to stop fighting and get the best deal that we can for our people. And he was backed in that by another powerful leader of the Sioux. This man right <coughs> here, I cut his name in half, but that's Spotted Tail. So Spotted Tail, get this down, Spotted Tail and uh, Red Cloud want, Spotted Tail and Red Cloud want peace. But Crazy Horse didn't. Crazy Horse said, I will fight until I die. I don't care what the odds are. I will fight until I die. Sitting Bull, get this down, was on the crazy horse's side. Sitting Bull said, no, we're going to fight until we die. Well, Red Cloud goes to the Army. He went to Fort Robinson, Nebraska, and he sat down in the commanding officer's office, and he said, if you don't kill Crazy Horse, this is what he said, if you don't kill Crazy Horse, he's going to start another Indian War. And so, well, that's not what he said. He said, if you don't arrest him, you got to arrest him. If you let Crazy Horse run free, he's going to start another Indian war. So here's what they did. They invited Crazy, you got this down. They invited Crazy Horse to come into Camp Robinson, Nebraska. And Crazy Horse came in unarmed except a knife. He had a small knife in his belt. <coughs> and these negotiations were going to be held in this little cabin they said, and so Crazy Horse dismounted and a group of soldiers got around him and they started walking toward this little cabin. And when they got close enough, Crazy Horse could look in the door of the cabin and he saw Native Americans chained up in a wall. And he said, I'm not going in. And he pulled his knife and he turned to bolt uh, and run. And this man, another Sioux, little big man, they still make movies about this guy, Little big man grabbed Crazy Horse by his arms and held him while two white soldiers bayoneted him to death. And as Crazy Horse fell to the ground, I think this is very telling, as Crazy Horse fell to the ground, he said, his last words were, and I quote, no white man is responsible for my death. I blame the Indians. All I wanted to do was to be let alone, end quote. By 1890, get this down, yeah, see, history is clear cut. The Indians all did this and the whites all did that. And the, uh -uh, that's not the way history, history's a complicated thing. <coughs> a lot of people are scared of it. Let me just do this real quick. A lot of people are scared of it because it destroys their preconceived notions. But anyway, my 1890 Sitting Bull was in South Dakota. Olivia Stevens, please come to the office. By 1890, get this down, Ro uh, Rose, Sitting Bull was in South Dakota at the Standing Rock Reservation. Just put him in South Dakota. And on December 15th, they came to arrest him, uh, two Hunk Papa Sioux policemen. At this time, everyone should report to the gym. Don't leave. We're accident. not done yet. Go straight to the gym, take all of your things. You'll get there. You're not going to miss a Do bit of a screaming, I assure you. You will be counted absent. Go straight to the gym. I'm going to finish this. And it was in the middle of the night, and two, two uh, Sioux policemen, here they are. There's Bullhead. And there's Catch the Bear. They were his fellow Sioux, and they knocked on the door. They were now policemen working for the Army. They knocked on the door. <clears throat> Sitting Bull was an older man, and he, he went, his 15-year-old, he, he had several children, but he had a 15-year-old son in there with him, and they were in bed, sound asleep. 
they hear a knock at the door and they get up and Sitting Bull was sleeping naked and he just threw a robe around himself and he went and opened the door and his son kind of got up to see what was going on and was standing behind him and they didn't say, come with us, what are you doing? They had, they had knocked on the door and just stepped back and when he opened the door, they just fired through and killed them both. Okay, and that was the end of Sitting Bull. Okay, well, get this down and we will stop. When we come back after your test, your test will go down to there and we'll start talking about Nez Perce and Chief jo uh, Chief Joseph. Now, where, where's this thing going to be held? The gym? Where? Yeah. Well, now you can scurry over to the gym. You want to leave your books, bags here, and just go and come back and pick them up after school? That's entirely up to you. Do whatever you want. Prop that door open, please. Now to cap the day off with an hour of screen.
Now, hurry. You don't have tomorrow's test? I've got tests, but I don't have them. Oh. I've got to go home tonight. I test for 7 o'clock last night, and I've got to go home and do the same thing now. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to go home and do the same thing tomorrow. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to go home and do the same thing tomorrow. I've got a doctor's appointment in the morning. I'm going to miss about two hours, but I'm coming first hour. So I'll have it here in the morning. Okay. I may do it right here before I leave in a minute, and I'll just lay it over there on your desk. Sounds good. Sounds good. <sighs> well, once they start screaming, the, the chants, the grave chants, I can't do that. That's just way too loud. So. <coughs> I'm so ready for next week. Oh, next week. Yes, ma'am, I'm interested in order uh, your product number 545.
Yes, ma'am. My name is Roger Thompson, and my phone number is 918-473-5146. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.
this. Well, make sure what? Well, I'll see you in the morning.